to say, our schools have changed dramatically in this era of unchecked gun violence. They have uh, fortified, they've increased the number of school resource officers on campuses. Um, and just in this, this past year, we reached over 75% of our nation's high schools with school resource officers. In addition, many states have um, 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 implemented their own police departments in Texas, Florida, Georgia, and other places. Um, our schools now have ALICE training drills throughout the nation. And then districts in several states have allowed teachers to be armed, including, in, including over 30% of systems in Texas. Facial recognition systems are being rolled out um, as well. So our schools have already fortified. And while we can see additional security measures um, can be implemented, Uvalde shows that these measures in place does not ensure safety. Um, there is no evidence the presence of law enforcement in U.S. schools has reduced the damage caused by gun violence. Federal data show that, yes, in 10 years, over the last 10 years, we have seen uh, a decline in student reports of, of weapons at school. But moreover, in the last seven years, we've seen uh, an increase in the number of deaths and injuries caused by gun violence. And then this year, we've had 34 school shootings already, which is more than the total of 2021. And I also want to mention that there are academic consequences for fortifying our schools. Um, instead of addressing the problem of easy access to guns, lawmakers have increased the placement of law enforcement within our schools. This has led to higher rates of school arrests for minor school disturbances and made many of our young people feel like suspects instead of students. We know that schools with police on campuses have a 12% higher referral rate of youth to law enforcement than schools that do not. And our research shows that students who attend schools that rely on law enforcement and other means of surveillance have lower test score performances and rates of college attendance relative to students in other schools with similar social background characteristics. So what do we need? Schools cannot do this alone. Their safety measures must be reinforced with gun violence solutions. Law enforcement and teachers need protection too, instead of putting them in harm's way within communities and states that have lax gun safety provisions. And yes, we need mental health checks for those who wish to own guns, but we also need those services within schools to support the social emotional well-being of our students. The best way to secure schools from student violence is to make sure that students feel respected, valued, have staff who approach them with trauma-informed strategies, and to make sure they feel connected and affirmed. And this will lead students to internalize pro-social behaviors towards greater self-regulation. And um, I'll stop there because I, I think our other panelists have wonderful solutions as well. Thanks so much, Otis. Daniel, turning to you, what does evidence reveal about the effectiveness of gun laws in preventing gun violence? Like Otis, I think I'm going to start with what doesn't work. Laws that allow individuals to buy firearms despite recent histories of violence or who are too young to be able to legally drink an alcoholic beverage. Studies show that these lax laws facilitate gun violence, or in the case of laws allowing 18-year-olds to buy firearms, increase suicides. Laws that temporarily bar individuals convicted of violent misdemeanors or those who are under restraining orders for domestic violence we found reduce homicides. Inexplicably, federal and some state firearm prohibitions don't protect women from armed and violent dating partners. More lives are saved, we found in the research that we've done with April Zioli, when all are protected. These, life, uh, these proven life-saving effects of firearm removal laws for persons with domestic violence restraining orders make me optimistic about extremist protection laws that they can save lives as well, provided there's proper implementation, something I'm sure Shannon will cover late, uh, later. But initial studies are very encouraging that they demonstrate that these laws can interrupt planned mass shootings, political violence, and more commonly suicide attempts. The best research shows that laws that make it easy to carry concealed firearms outside the home tend to increase violent crime. It's well known that weaknesses in federal and state laws facilitate gun trafficking. 
when states extend background checks to private transfers, gun trafficking is reduced. However, in a seminal study led by our colleague Alex McCourt, we contrast the changes in homicides and suicides when states change their laws requiring handgun purchasers to buy a license with what happened when states adopted comprehensive background checks without a licensing system. It was only when the licensing was combined with background checks where we saw significant life-saving effects. We've published many studies showing that firearm purchaser licensing reduces multiple forms of gun deaths and gun crime, including mass shootings. Our study of fatal mass shootings also found that bans of large capacity magazines are protective in reducing casualties. Finally, laws that require gun owners to lock up their guns so that they're not accessible to underage youth have been shown to reduce teen suicides and teen perpetrated homicides. While we don't have any study yet that examined the effects of these laws on school shootings, it's noteworthy <clears throat> that the large majority, majority of school shootings are perpetrated by students from those schools who bring guns that are owned by adults from their own households, but those guns are not adequately locked up. So I think we have a good evidence base to guide our policies so that we can have much lower rates of gun violence. Thanks, Daniel. Shannon, picking up on a thread that Daniel started, can you provide an overview of extreme risk protection orders or ERPOs? What are they and how can they help prevent gun violence? Sure. Um, thank you, Lainey, and thank you to those who are tuning in today for this important discussion. Um, we find ourselves as a country asking once again, what can we do to prevent this gun violence? And, um, you know, I'm happy to say um, that we on this panel think about this a lot, and there are concrete things that can be done. Uh, Daniel provided a nice list of some solutions that are definitely available on the table. And one of the things that uh, for me is most promising and that I spend a lot of time working on are extreme risk protection orders. So extreme risk protection orders are a civil court order that allows the court to temporarily prohibit people who are behaving dangerously and at risk of violence from purchasing and possessing guns. Extreme risk protection or laws are in place in 19 states and the District of Columbia, and we see them being used in, in different situations all across this country. I'm involved in a multi-state study of extreme risk protection order laws, and in that position, I've been able to review hundreds of petitions for extreme risk protection orders. And what I see over and over and over again is that people are coming to the court and are requesting these orders when they see indications that their loved ones, um, that people who are close to them are behaving in ways that are clearly indicating that they're in crisis and they're at risk of harming others, sometimes many people, or harming themselves. Extreme risk protection orders provide a court ordered way for society to intervene before violence happens. In that window, when we know that someone is in crisis, when we know that violence could be imminent, and when we have good information to suggest that we just don't want to wait for that crime to happen or for that self-harm event to happen, ERPOs allow us to intervene and take the guns out of the mix so that solutions to that crisis can be worked out without having to deal with guns. So ERPOs are, again, something that after reviewing hundreds of petitions, I see being used to prevent school shootings, to prevent people who are in crisis and talking about uh, suicide from taking those actions and to prevent the kinds of interpersonal assaults that are happening in our communities, in our homes every day. So when I look at potential solutions, extreme risk protection orders are one solution that are in place 
um, in most um, in, in states across this country and that have the potential to really make a difference when we think about intervening early and removing guns from the mix when people are behaving dangerously and violence is a real risk. Thanks, Shannon. Yes, what do we know from a research perspective about American public opinion towards gun violence prevention measures? Yeah, thanks, Lainey, and thanks to everyone who's here today. Following the Sandy Hook school shooting, our center has become a leader in public opinion polling on gun policy. We've conducted the national survey on gun policy every two years since 2013. We don't ask vague questions like, do you think we should have more or less gun control or should our gun laws be stronger? What do those mean? Like how are answers to those questions helpful to policymakers? What concrete things could be done with that information? Very little. The narrative in our country is that there's a great divide by gun ownership or political party on solutions to gun violence. And that's why we can't get anything done. I say gun policy is mostly political among politicians. Many Americans, including the majority of gun owners, support evidence-based policy. Some of those policies have been mentioned today. You've heard how these can be effective um, at addressing multiple forms of violence. And, and I'll mention briefly support for some of those policies. Laws that require an individual to obtain a license from law enforcement to verify their identity and ensure they're not prohibited, those uh, laws that Daniel mentioned, are supported by more than 75% of Americans, including 63% of gun owners and 70% of Republicans. Laws that allow for the temp temporary removal of firearms during elevated risk that Shannon just discussed are supported by more than 75% of Americans, including more than two thirds of gun owners and 75% of Republicans. Domestic violence restraining orders, the laws that extreme risk protection orders are modeled off of, also enjoy high levels of support. 81% of Americans support prohibiting gun possession by those subject to a temporary domestic violence restraining order, including 74% of gun owners and 80% of Republicans. That's because, as Shannon mentioned, many people agree that there are certain situations where it's dangerous for an individual to have access to firearms example, if they are actively discussing harming themselves or others or have already caused harm. Many Americans also recognize that there are spaces that are too sensitive for people to legally carry firearms. Only about 25% of Americans think people who can legally carry should be able to bring guns onto the grounds of K-12 schools or college campuses. Only a third of gun owners support gun carrying on K-12 school campuses and 45% support guns on campus. To put it another way, more than half of gun owners support restrictions on where they can carry guns. We've seen a trend of lowering or removing restrictions for concealed carry across the country, including permitless carry that allows people to carry a gun without training, background checks, or a license, uh, which is now legal in almost half of our states. These actions are in direct contrast to what we know about the effects of and support for these policies. Only 20% of Americans and less than a third of gun owners think it's a good idea to allow people to carry loaded concealed handguns in public without a license. In the wake of recent mass shootings committed by 18 year olds, there's been renewed focus on minimum age laws. Two thirds of Americans including more than half of gun owners and Republicans, think people under the age of 21 should not be able to have a handgun. There's even greater support for requiring someone who wants to buy a semi-automatic rifle to be at least 21. 73% of Americans overall, 60% of gun owners, and 70% of Republicans. Laws that limit magazine capacity to 10 rounds are one of the few policies where we don't see majority support among gun owners. Large capacity magazine bans are supported by more than 60% of Americans, but only 38% of gun owners. These are an important accessory 
that can facilitate someone firing many rounds very quickly, increasing the likelihood they could cause substantial harm. I think it's important, um, there's an important opportunity to engage with credible messengers to increase support. One thing I hope you've noticed in the data that I've presented is a trend. We have evidence-based solutions that exist right now that are supported by the majority of Americans from a range of backgrounds and experiences. We have the tools, we have the support, and we need to act. Thank you, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Cass. Finally, Josh, I'll turn to you. At this moment, what challenges does gun violence pose for American democracy? Well, thanks, Lenny. Thanks for having me. And I appreciate this amazing being part of this just amazing panel. So I think gun violence is, is really a challenge right now for a couple of different reasons. There's, there's a number of reasons, but I want to talk about two that I think are front and center. Um, one is the violence and intimidation in political spaces. And the other is the resurgence of race-based violence, both fueled by that both fueled by unlimited access to firearms, and they're both of these the political spaces and the race-based violence are rooted in replacement theory that certain voices are superior to others, and then you couple that with the wrong, wrongful idea that violence, individual violence, is justified by the Second Amendment, which has been amplified by the right, and what you get is a permission structure for political extremists to use armed violence to obtain political objectives and disenfranchise political opponents. I think a great example of this was the widespread failure to universally condemn the Unite, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. Let me drill down and just give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about in both of these spheres. So the, the rise of armed intimidation in the political process is something that we've seen and I've actually personally felt. I, I lobby and, and, and participate in, in democracy in a number of states regularly. Um, and I can tell you that over the last several years, the rise of guns in public spaces, especially the rise of assault weapons in state legislatures and in municipal government. For instance, when you walk into the Virginia legislature, you're often greeted by armed uh, armed people and in, in oftentimes now people bring firearms into even city council hearings and county council hearings. Um, and that's coupled, so you see a sort of more access to firearms and more, and more firearms in political spaces. But then you sort of see that morph into actual violence and actual and real political intimidation. So you see the rise of the militia movement and armed hate groups. You see the rise of violence in the, in the Western lands movement. Um, often focus to government installations, so like the Bundy Ranch in the Malore Wildlife Reservation in Oregon. In 2020, we saw the Michigan and Idaho legislators actually taken over by armed individuals protesting mask mandates. Again, things that they may not like, um, but they're, they were duly in place by elected officials. Um, going into 2020, we saw that there were, right after the election, that there were firearms and armed protesters outside ballot counting facilities, causing some of them to actually shut down temporarily and causing election workers well-documented. Uh, this has been well-documented for fear for their safety. Um, and then, of course, we saw the Capitol insurrection in 2021. I think it's a mistake, though, to see that as the penultimate act. Um, that's something, this armed intimidation, armed firearms in political spaces is something that is continuing and it's very chilling for democracy. And I expect that not to stop after the Capitol insurrection, but actually we're seeing that continue and grow in other spaces. Um, the same idea we can see that, that um, you know, this whole replacement theory idea that there are people that are superior and that others shouldn't have voices. We see that um, play out in actual white supremacist violence. Um, so we've seen, we've seen that theory in political spaces and intimidation and then the resurgent of race-based violence um, fueled by really unlimited access to weapons. So at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 2018, then El Paso Walmart in 2020, and then just tragically, horribly, two in the Topps grocery store at Buffalo, New York, uh, two weeks ago. All the assailants in these incidences were motivated by replacement theory. Uh, it, of course, it posits there's a system of global movement to replace white, the white race. And ultimately, right, these were fueled, this, this idea and this ideology was fueled by unlimited access to weapons. 
So let's just, I just want to bring these threads together. Political violence and white supremacist violence are rooted in the same idea, that violence is acceptable approach to keep or gain power. And that's the very antithesis of democracy. We believe that democracies must believe in peaceable decision-making and, and, and peaceable transfer of power. Those are the fundamental values that we have to share as a democracy. And what we're seeing both, both in the rise of political violence and the rise of hate-based violence is an effort to suppress people who want to exercise their rights in the democratic process. Again, what the United States has done, unlike other democratic countries, is that they have failed to meaningly, meaningfully regulate firearms and therefore empowered political and racial extremism that now put the fabric of our democracy at risk. So what do we need to do about that? And I think that's the question that we're all faced. Number one, we need to name and dismantle the permission structures that enable political hate and motivated violence. It's not that we just should, we should condemn it, we should name it, but we also need to understand that where, where, there, where we see this activating, we need to take actions to reduce whether it's, you know, whether it's, whether it's armed militia groups, which by the way are illegal in all 50 states, uh, whether it's a political party, we need to be clear that this is just not acceptable. Number two, we need to understand that the Second Amendment does not protect the right to uh, political violence. That's something that we just have to, we cannot, we cannot take. And the third thing is we just have to disarm hate. We have to do things that we've heard the panelists talk about today. Of course, other ideas, but we definitely need to do that. Thanks so much, Josh. So, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. We've had lots of questions coming in, and I want to make sure that we get to as many of them as possible. Also, thank you to everyone who's been submitting questions. Please continue to do so. I am keeping an eye on your questions as they come in, um, and there's plenty of time to continue submitting questions. So, Otis, I'm, I'm going to start with you, and we've had many questions coming in that relate to the school safety. First, please can serve as role models and bring others within a school example, um, counselors. Are, are there examples of this where it, where it does work well? Lanny, I'm not certain I heard the entire question, but if the question is, can police serve as role models within schools? Um, I would say yes, but uh, one of the questions we should all be asking about the presence of law enforcement within schools is what are they doing um, the other 99.9% .9 of the time uh, that they're not um, engaged in, in stopping an active shooter situation or, or any uh, gun weapons possession within schools. And the concern here is that they're spending that time criminalizing what is otherwise normative child and adolescent behavior. Um, and there again, we then see the unintended consequences of the presence of law enforcement within schools. Um, yes, we want them there to, to, to stop a shooter, um, but at the same time, we have them there for so many hours of the day that they're having unintended impacts and actually uh, criminalizing, uh, especially black and brown youth. So there are racial disparities that arise in these schools because of the presence of law enforcement. Thanks, Otis. I'm going to stick with you and ask a follow-up question mm -hmm. related to um, school police. So we're hearing a lot right now about um, some folks saying school police are the wrong solution, both to school mass shootings and more common violence in neighborhoods. Others say school police offer at least some line and What are your thoughts? Yes, I agree that uh, there are situations where we should have law enforcement within schools. I, I think there are schools where it might work. Uh, so I'm not one that's unilaterally going to say that no law enforcement should be within schools. But 
law enforcement should be trained to be in schools and they also should have um, um, a better understanding of child development issues, of second chance uh, 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 options and restorative justice and trauma-informed practices. We can't have officers in schools that believe the same way that they're conducting their, their, their job within some criminal um, um, or, or off-campus situation is the way they should conduct their job within schools. Um, but I, I want to bring this back to the issue of gun violence, Lanny, because a gun is also a risk to law enforcement and law enforcement should be protected as well from being within communities and states with lax gun laws. So not only should we, we, we look to law enforcement for protection, but we also need to support them in, in offering that protection. Uh, and the only way that can happen is with uh, a sincere effort uh, at gun safety policy. Okay, um, Lainey's been having some internet issues and I'm gonna um, sub in for her. And um, we, we have some uh, questions coming in for the, through the chat. And I think one, the first one is actually probably for me. How do reactions to recent mass shootings reflect confusion over the types of gun violence, mass shootings versus community violence? Who has good data distinguishing these types? Um, I, I, it, it is important to understand that there are some things that are unique about uh, mass shootings um, and that, that are distinct from other forms of gun violence. On the other hand, I think we can actually overemphasize that. Um, first of all, in terms of the, you know, really in-depth data that help us understand the nature of gun violence, our general systems at the federal level are really quite weak. Uh, they have huge gaps. They don't tell us a lot about the underlying issues going on. Uh, we're actually very committed to a process uh, called homicide or shooting review process. It gathers very in-depth data so you really understand the contextual issues going on with gun violence. And we're trying to build up those resources at a local level so we understand uh, gun violence at, uh, uh, that happens more on a common basis. When researchers have done this recently with mass shootings, we really have, uh, have been able to understand uh, what's driving this much better. And again, I'm gonna come back to the commonalities across multiple forms of gun violence, whether they involve intimate partner violence, community violence, or some of our mass shooting scenarios is easy access to guns, um, the violence principally committed by, by males, men, and um, you know, lax, uh, lax laws uh, that, that underlie that. And, you know, there are other issues too with respect to early trauma and in, in, in the lives of these individuals. So it's, there's a lot we can learn, I think, by not only understanding the differences, but also the common links so that we have strategies that don't very narrowly just pick off one form of gun violence, but actually have broad impacts. Thanks, Daniel. Shannon, lots of questions coming in for you related to ERPOs. So I'm, I'm gonna send a few your way. I'm, I'll start with this one. If there are guns in a home owned by household members who are not actually the focus of the ERPO, does the order allow for removal of those additional weapons? Yes, so some of that um, depends on the specifics of the law, but we have seen instances in which access is specified and um, access can allow for removal of uh, weapons from, for instance, parents. So we've seen instances in which uh, there's concern about a school shooter and credible threats of school shootings and access to the guns in the homes would allow for that shooting to take place. And um, law enforcement can intervene and focus on those guns in the home, work with the parents when that's possible to reduce access and in cases where needed, remove those guns um, from the home um, through the ERPO petition. Okay, 
Thanks, Shannon. I'm going to stay with you and, and focus on ERPOs for a few more questions. Who can initiate an ERPO? That's a great question, and it's something that varies across the states. So in all states, what we see is that law enforcement can petition the court and initiate an ERPO. In almost all states, what we see is family members and intimate partners are also authorized as ERPO petitioners. And in some states, we also see different categories of people who are eligible to petition. So there are a growing number of states actually where clinicians are authorized as petitioners. So this recognizes that oftentimes clinicians are on the front lines of really witnessing those dangerous behaviors of, of uh, sort of seeing when people are in crisis and when violence may be imminent. So we see clinicians as another category of petitioners in some states. And then we also see some states where school administrators are also among those who are able to petition. So there's, um, it's a bit of a variety. It depends on the states. Um, and, um, but in all cases, law enforcement are able to petition. Thanks, Shannon. I, one more on, on ERPOs and then I'll switch topics. What do we know from a, a research angle? Um, has anyone been able to quantify the potential positive effects of ERPOs in reducing gun violence and gun related deaths? Yeah, so as, as Daniel mentioned uh, in his opening remarks, ERPOs are based on uh, evidence that we have from domestic violence restraining orders. So we have good studies that really speak to the ability of um, what we see with domestic violence restraining orders that include prohibitions on gun purchase and possession. We see statistically a, a significant associations between states with domestic violence restraining orders that prohibit gun purchase and possession and reductions in intimate partner homicide generally and intimate partner gun homicide in particular. So based on that evidence um, really is where ERPOs came from. The idea that if this civil court process for temporarily dispossessing people of their guns is associated with reductions in, in homicide, then why not expand that authority to include other types of, of dangerous behavior and address other types of violence? So we have that evidence to look for, which again leads me to really look at ERPOs as promising. We also have some other evidence that is based on anecdote. Again, as I mentioned, I've um, reviewed hundreds of ERPO petitions at this point and really see how these petitions are being used to intervene when credible threats of violence exist. And the violence is um, with regard to threats to commit mass shooting, uh, shooting of the type that we've seen in recent weeks and in this country in the past years, but it's also um, in response to the types of violence that is very common and pervasive, all too pervasive in our homes and communities and results in lost life through homicide and through suicide as well. Thanks, Shannon. Josh, I'm going to turn to you and um, and pick up on some themes that you mentioned in your, your opening remarks. So given the, the current gridlock that we see in Congress, what are potential strategies to, um, to both promote and secure American democracy while also seeing effective solutions to gun violence put in place? And this um, the, the question asks, for example, might we think about um, collective bargaining action that comes through teachers unions or or other less traditional approaches i think you know those are that's a very interesting idea that i haven't given a ton of thought to but i do think there are some social constructs that we need to think about and you can see that in, in business response to these as well but i'll tell you because i think one of the biggest issues that we face and this is something in general with these policies is that we tend to look at the federal government as, as, as gridlock and so we can't do much there um, i will say there seems to be some legitimate discussions going on right now in the federal government and i mean i'm, I'm hopeful that we will see some changes coming in the next couple of weeks but a lot of my experience in making this change is, in, is at the state level and i think that's where advocacy and activism can really make a difference it's never easy um, you, you really have to commit to making these changes and, uh, but we see that groups who 
work for the long term, who um, are well resourced, who have expertise, but most often just stick with it, can make change at the state level. Um, my my most a lot of my experience actually is informed by my work in Virginia. I live in Virginia. I've worked with uh, survivors and others in Virginia for a long time. We we stuck with it. We worked year after year, and we were able to make substantial changes. Um, not just in getting background checks and ERPA law, which we're very, very proud of, but, but, but also in making some changes that I think go to the central core of this democracy issue, which is that we've allowed local governments to prevent guns in their, in their buildings. We've prevented guns on Capitol Square in Virginia and coming into the Virginia legislature. So there are opportunities to make change, especially in, in, in sort of our democracy agenda when it comes to gun, uh, gun reforms, but, they, but a lot of them will happen at the state level. And look, that's where, the, that's where a lot of this democracy happens. And that's where the doc democracy is being eroded when people can't feel comfortable going to their, uh, their council meetings, going to the state legislatures. And through, we've found that through persistent advocacy, we can actually change the laws and protect the democratic uh, process in the states. Um, and I, I would urge people to find your local state gun violence prevention group, work with them and help make systemic change in your state and locality. Thanks, Josh. Cass, question for you. So in your opening remarks, you described a, a generally broad support for many evidence-based solutions to gun violence. Does that mean that we should feel optimistic that, that laws have changed? In other words, has public opinion changed over time and does that give reason for optimism about legal approaches? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we generally have seen pretty strong and stable support for many of these policies, if not increases in support for sort of evidence-based gun safety policies and decreases in support for laws that would expand gun rights or gun carrying. I think one of the challenges has been um, this support has not always translated into action by policymakers. Uh, we have a very broad uh, level of support, but that doesn't always translate to depth, uh, where people are activated uh, to contact their legislators, uh, show up, uh, submit written or oral testimony. I think we're really starting to see a shift over the last several years where we are seeing people uh, as single issue voters on the side of gun safety um, to counteract uh, the longstanding single issue uh, voters we've seen for gun rights. So I am optimistic, not just because we know that there are lots of people who support uh, reasonable restrictions on gun purchasing and gun carrying, but I'm optimistic because we know that these policies work. They're in place in many states right now across the country. So those two things together help me uh, maintain optimism. Thanks, Cass. Otis, I'm gonna turn back to you and we have lots of questions coming in that relate to, to school safety. First, what do we know about the impacts of active shooter drills on the psychological well-being of K-12 students? Um, that's a great question. And unfortunately, it's it, the data are spotty. Um, you know, there, there would need to be a uh, more comprehensive data collection effort, perhaps in the National Center for Education Statistics at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and I am not aware of data um, that are widespread like that. Um, however, we do know through, you know, research of, of specific school systems that some students find those drills a bit unsettling. Uh, I hear personally from, from many families and many parents um, and teachers as well uh, that those drills inspire some, some doubt in um, the ability of their, their schools to keep children safe. Um, and oftentimes, um, we just have to think about this in terms of, of mental health. Uh, and the, the fact that we are asking teachers and students to be hyper vigilant, uh, to always be thinking about an active shooter and what they might do when that happens, um, kind of communicates inevitability to them and probably some other type of, of stress. And again, we don't know exactly uh, to what extent this is manifesting in students and teachers, but it is just a, a logical extension of, 
of where we are in this time of, of, of uh, unchecked gun violence. Thanks, Otis. And, and one more for you. Given the, the thousands of schools and school districts throughout the country, has anything emerged as best practices relative to school safety or interesting and promising pilots? I, again, I would say that uh, the measures that were taken at Uvalde, uh, at Rob Elementary, are commonplace and recommended by a lot of our, our safety and security experts. Um, however, again, the question is, would those measures rise to the level of effectiveness needed when there's an active shooter? Um, unfortunately, someone with a gun can shoot that locked door open. Um, and I don't know that uh, some of these measures are a great deterrence um, for those who are actually planning or motivated to, to uh, use a gun. So I, I can't say that uh, these are best practices that would that stand up to the current circumstances that we, we find um, at play in at, at, at Rob Elementary. However, you know there there are ways that we can make schools safer. Um, I suggest that we think about trauma informed practices. Make sure that we're addressing instances of bullying. Provide the social emotional support for students within schools um, to make sure that they're feeling connected and that they belong and affirm. And that way they then will internalize a lot of the pro-social behaviors that we hope all students have. Um, that would, and as you know, uh, Daniel said uh, earlier, that would reduce probably the, the majority of the gun violence within schools um, because those uh, rates are, are largely driven by actual students. So there, there are some things that, that will work and, and what we need to do is make sure those things that are effective are supported with a broader uh, um, reinforcement from gun violence solutions and policy. Thanks, Otis. Daniel, turning to you, how do, how do you explain from a research perspective why it seems like some cities that have stronger gun violence prevention laws also seem to have higher rates of gun-related violence? So first of all, I would just say that it's not at all clear that that's true. Um, you can pick and choose what cities you, you want to, to make whatever claims you, you're trying to make. Uh, it's um, worth conveying that um, there are a host of reasons why cities vary in their rates of homicides and other violent crimes. Sometimes it's simply a matter of how they draw their boundaries. There are some cities, particularly in the West, that have very large boundaries and mostly suburban population. There are other cities, Baltimore and St. Louis come to mind, um, that have very narrow boundaries and relatively small amount of their population is, is suburban. So part of it is simply have how boundaries are, are, are set up. There are other factors that uh, have to do with concentrated uh, disadvantage very much on racial lines that explain a substantial uh, uh, differences across cities. So there's there are a number of things that that impact um, homicide and, 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 and other gun crimes uh, levels from cities to city. Thanks, Daniel. Josh, moving to you. In, um, you talked about your experience living and working in Virginia and, and, and Maryland. How, if at all, do you see neighboring states working together in developing gun laws? Well, I think, it, you know, there's often a regional effect and we, and we see that states, you know, that states attorney generals, non public safety officials trying to, trying to work together to build strategies. I, I think that part of the issue is that you have, um, you know, there, there are certain states where uh, within, for instance, in our, in our, you know, in our region uh, that are very difficult and are often fueling some of the, some of the gun violence. So in, in, in and, and let's just actually take a step back. When you think, 
about regional cooperation, you need to think about that there's often changing politics in my home state of Virginia, as well as Maryland. Um, and so I definitely think there are regional approaches and we're seeing governors come together to, to um, build those approaches. But one of the things, and, and this is where I think the federal gridlock becomes a real problem, is that when you're in a region and one state has grossly weaker laws than the other, that state is gonna often be the source of firearms. And so one of the reasons that we need federal regulation and that we do need to break this gridlock in Washington on these issues is that we need more than a state by state approach. I'm very in favor of that approach. I do think it makes a difference. You can see that in the overall gun death rates in the various states, but ultimately we're going to need a solution um, that, you know, that, that is going to be a federal approach because you know, there's a we often in these regional approaches, there's a weak link. And that's where actually a lot of the guns will start flowing from. So we have to develop, it's a really important state law matters greatly, but ultimately if we're not gonna get it everywhere, we're gonna need a federal approach. Thanks, Josh. Shannon, many more questions coming in for you related to ERPOs. So I'm gonna send a few your way now. First, can you explain the difference between an ERPO and a protective order related to intimate partner violence? Sure. Um, so, you know, again, they're, they're quite related, right? ERPO, we really do think of ERPO as an expansion of a domestic violence protective order, but there are a couple of um, important differences that I'll just highlight. Um, so with the domestic violence protective order, those are initiated um, by the person who is experiencing the violence in most cases. Um, so that's the, um, the authority to initiate that process really rests with the, with the victim in that relationship. With regard to extreme risk protection orders, the people who can initiate um, these processes may be the person or the people who are at risk of experiencing the violence. But what we see is that there are people who are authorized to petition who are sort of on the front lines of witnessing those dangerous behaviors and witnessing the crisis that the person is experiencing unfolding. So again, we see for extreme risk protection orders that law enforcement are most often the petitioners in these cases, um, but that there are also family members and there are in some cases clinicians and school administrators who are authorized to petition as well. So who's initiating these proceedings is one difference. And the other key difference that I'll mention is what the orders do. So depending on the state, a uh, domestic violence protection order offers a, a wide range of options for intervening to address the violence or the threat of violence that's happening between um, partners in that relationship. So a domestic violence protection order might include orders to stay away. It might involve um, access to property. It might involve um, where the respondent to that order is living. It might involve custody issues. And in a lot of states, they can also speak to the respondent's ability to purchase and possess guns. ERPOs, on the other hand, are very focused. ERPOs are about limiting access to guns when a person is behaving dangerously and at risk of violence. So the so what an ERPO does is it allows for that temporary dispossession of firearms that the respondent may be in possession of, and they allow for the temporary prohibition of any purchase of new guns. So again, it's a laser focus with the ERPOs that are really focused on access to lethal means. Thanks, Shannon. Daniel, question for you. What can we learn from the law or policy approaches that other countries have taken to address gun violence? Yes, well, uh, it's worth stating, if it's not obvious, that the United States is quite unusual in its incredibly lax uh, regulations of firearms when we compare ourselves to other uh, high-income Western democracies. Um, Virtually all of these other nations have some form of a licensing system for purchasing firearms um, that is far more restricted than in uh, what we have in, in, even in the, the stricter states within the United States. But, but a lot of it is 
uh, grounded in, a, in licensing processes uh, with much greater care for vetting people uh, who uh, are applying to purchase guns to have in their homes or, or uh, some to carry on their person outside of the homes. So the, the main, uh, look, th there are some very broad bans that uh, frankly would never happen within the United States politically or, or constitutionally. But uh, the general lessons I think we can learn is a much more careful process uh, and higher standards for legal gun possession and carrying and a much more rigorous licensing process. So I think those are the key takeaways that again, we find consistently within our own studies within the United States for the few, uh, the smaller number of states that uh, take similar approaches. Thanks, Daniel. In our final moments together, I want to give each of you a chance to, to give a quick response to one last question. And I'll, I'll go in the order that you made your opening remarks. So Otis, this will come to you first. The, the title of this session concerns gun violence prevention and effective and fair solutions. So this question concerns um, the solution piece. In today's political climate, what do you see as a single realistic policy goal that could potentially be achieved in the next year? And Otis, as I said, I'll start with you. A realistic policy goal. I think um, among the population, among, among voters, of course, that there's some great consensus across different gun violence solutions. Uh, Cass mentioned many of them, and I agree that those could be uh, actionable. Uh, the gridlock in in the, the the Congress, of course, and with state legislatures, is is a is something totally different. So, I suggest that everyone, um, you know, vote and get out there and express their views about gun violence solutions with their vote, and that way we can move forward uh, toward uh, a reduction in school shootings. Thanks, Otis. Daniel, same question to you. In the current political climate, what do you see as a realistic policy goal over the course of the next year or so? So um, what I think is, and, and frankly, I'm anticipating what some of my colleagues are gonna say, so I'm gonna go for, <laughs> don't wanna steal their thunder. But uh, I think that uh, many states that now have um, background check requirements for private transfers uh, we are going to start to see sta states uh, one up that one more to also include a licensing system because, as, as I've said earlier, that is where you start to see the big life-saving effects. I think that's the thing I'm looking for. I'll speak another one in is probably some of those same states uh, will elevate their minimum age restrictions to 21 for um, both handguns and some automatic rifles. Thanks, Daniel. Shannon, same question to you. Thank you, Lainey. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to say that the most realistic and probably the policy goal that I'm most excited about is federal funding for ERPO implementation. Um, so any any law on the books, um, guns or otherwise, are only as good as the efforts to make sure that they are implemented and enforced. And what we're seeing around the states with regard to ERPO is tremendous variation in how they're used. And part of that is because we need support for the infrastructures needed to allow for these laws to be implemented. So there is, are currently um, federal proposals that are in play that would fund states and localities to implement their ERPO laws. So I think this is important, an important role for the federal government. And I think it could also help to incentivize other states that don't yet have ERPO laws on the books to give them a good look and really uh, consider them in their next legislation as well. So federal funding for ERPO implementation is my realistic policy goal that I'll end with. Thanks, Shannon. Cass, same question to you. Yeah, so I'll plus one the things that have been said before, and I would add um, closing the default proceed loophole, or at least extending more time for law enforcement. Currently, under federal law, law, law enforcement has three days to complete that check, and people buy firearms from licensed dealers because the default is to proceed in the absence of complete 
And I think there's a real desire to make sure that we're only selling firearms to people who successfully complete a background check. So I would like to see some more focus on that default proceed loophole. Thanks, Cass and Josh. In our last minute together, you get the final word. So same question to you. Yeah, so I agree with everything that's been said before, licensing or both fall proceed. I'll just say this. The ability for someone who's just turned 18 years old to buy a similar mac assault weapon, 1,600 rounds of ammunition, is a threat to both our public safety, our children, and our democracy. And this is a moment to do all of what we've heard here because we love our children, we need to safeguard our democracy, and we need to get something done. Thanks, Josh. And now I'll wrap up by thanking our panelists, Otis Johnson, Daniel Webster, Shannon Frateroli, Cass Kerfasi, and Josh Horwitz for joining me today. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to everyone who attended this briefing and to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. A recording of this event will be made available on this website. Today's panelists, together with other faculty from across Johns Hopkins, will continue to analyze the gun violence crisis as well as effective and fair solutions. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Josh. And now I'll wrap up by thanking our panelists, Otis Johnson, Daniel Webster, Shannon Frateroli, Cass Kerfasi, and Josh Horwitz for joining me today. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to everyone who attended this briefing and to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. A recording of this event will be made available on this website. Today's panelists, together with other faculty from across Johns Hopkins, will continue to analyze the gun violence crisis as well as effective and fair solutions. Thank you again for joining us.